Hey, thanks for being here this morning. My name is Andrea Smith. I have the privilege of being the pastor here at West, and we are so grateful that you are either here in this space with us or you're worshiping with us online, live stream, or you're watching or listening to us on demand. Today, we are going to talk about uh, the movie in our summer message series, Summer at the Movies, and how movies can also tie into our faith. We're going to talk about the movie, The Peanut Butter Falcon. Will you clap if you have, if you are aware of that movie or you've seen that movie? <laughs> Clap if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, a few of you. Um, I had not heard of it until we were brainstorming and staff and, and Lane suggested that we watch Peanut Butter Falcon and talk about it. It is a powerful movie. It's PG-13 rated and I have learned in the last several uh, days that that does not mean what it used to when I was growing up. So PG-13 means that there is profanity and also crude or rude or inappropriate gestures and unfortunately even the, the F word uh, can be used once in a PG-13 movie. That's some fun trivia that you can share with your friends at your next trivia night uh, because Dave, thank goodness, edits the videos that I send and he's like Andrea we cannot show this I'm like it's pivotal it's the whole message and he's like it has the f word and we've made that mistake here before accidentally and we prefer not to make it again and uh because that was mortifying and um so I'm like, what, what are we going to do? So we figured out a way around it. But I'm like, it was PG-13, I promise. And he's like, well, pr apparently you can use the F word once in a film and it be PG-13. Not more than once, but once. So there you go. So I'm warning you now, even without that, there are still a few more innocuous, if there is such a thing, words that um, I personally probably not in my best self use when I'm frustrated or whatever. And and there is a crude gesture that is made in the movie. So if you have a child that is worshiping with you, just go on and tell them this is not good. You don't do what our pastor says or does uh, when it comes to that. Uh, she, she is not always her best self. And so anyway, there, it's really pretty innocuous, but it's such a great movie. And we're going to tie it into a story of our faith. And it's so interesting. We don't preach a lot from the Old Testament. This fall, uh, when, when summer's over and we settle back into just some routine and stuff, we are going to do some deconstruction of Scripture and see what it means, why it was written, when it was written. And we're going to look at the Old Testament in depth. But I'm telling you, it is like a version of Sister Wives uh, a couple thousand years ago. So if you have ever heard of Abraham, Abraham is like the father of the Israelites, of the, of the holy people, and the father of the tribes, and he's actually known to be the father of not just Judaism and ultimately Christianity, but also uh, Islam, and, and so he is a predominant figure in our Hebrew scriptures, and so we are going to talk about Joseph today, who is a direct uh, heir of Abraham, and what got us to Joseph is lots of multiple marriages and polygamy, and it's an example of how polygamy never really works out well for anyone, and it's true in the scriptures today. But we're going to look at this guy named Joseph who lacked in self-awareness and could have done some things differently in his life that ended up getting him into a lot of trouble. But even when he got into a lot of trouble, God always used his life for good, and that is the ultimate point of today. We all have potential potential. We live into our potential a lot, and then there are days that we just, we miss the mark. So today I want you to explore inwardly, like, what do you think your potential is? Are you living into it? What are the hurdles that get in the way of you living into your potential? Is there missed potential in your life? And I hope you walk away at the end of this hour with the idea that you are beautifully and wonderfully made in the image of the Imago Dei, which is absolute love and perfection. And we are made in that image. And as long as we are striving to be our best selves and every day be a little bit better than the day before, then we are living into that walk with God. 
And so I hope you walk away with that idea today, and we're going to tie it in to the Peanut Butter Falcon. If you are new here to the West community, the number that uh, we would like for you to text is on the screen. We have a gift for you outside, and we would like for you to text that number. Pick up that gift after worship and let us know that you're here. If you're online, text that number, and Dawn will be in touch and, and send you a gift. And uh, it's so dark in here. I did not know you were still standing. You may be seated. If you'd been walking, you could have increased your steps for today. But anyway, uh, thanks for being here, and I hope you find the rest of the service meaningful and relevant. Thanks. So Zach wants to be a professional wrestler. His family abandoned him because he was born with Down syndrome. They abandoned him, and he ends up being raised in a nursing home, a, a senior adult living facility. The lady uh, that you see in the movie is raising him, and she is his caregiver. And Zach realizes that he does not want to be in that facility anymore, so he is deemed a flight risk. At one point early in the movie, you see him uh, trying to, he has conspired with one of the fellow residents and gets her to pretend that she is choking. While she is choking and all the personnel are working with her, he tries to run away. He does not get very far, so then he gets put back in the facility, and his, uh, his roommate shows him that, and you saw this in the trailer, that if he lathers up with lotion, they have worked to pull the bars of the window apart, that he can slide through the bars, and that's ultimately how he gets free. So he begins his life on the lamb and, and running, and he hides out in a boat where he is found when his friend ends up running away from some people that he owed a lot of money to. That's the premise of the movie. Zach is trying to find his dreams, achieve his dreams, and he wants to be a pro wrestler. He has been watching this wrestler on TV, on VHS tapes, over and over and over again. And the wrestler has this really famous move that he shows where he lifts people up and like throws them to their demise and he wins. And so they promise that they will take Zach to the wrestler. And so the plot of the movie unwinds as they journey to help Zach find his dreams. An unlikely friendship is formed and compassion is shown. Not in the way that you would think, though. The compassion that is shown and that is the change agent in the movie is the compassion that Zach shows for everyone and how it changes them. If you were in here at the start of the service or watching online at the start of the service, we played an interview of the actors. And they share how making this movie with Zach, who does in real life deal with the disability of Down syndrome, how making this movie with Zach changed everything for them. It's a powerful movie. It's a powerful plot line, it's a powerful story, and it's not just one that is in the movies. It's a plot line and a story that we all live into in our lives. Potential, living into our potential, having hurdles that pop up in front of us over and over again, trying to figure out what path we're on, and is our path the right one, and do we need to go a different way, what's happening? We try to tie relevant and culturally relevant things into our lives so that we can tie our faith into what we experience every day. It's interesting, we have two families at West that have sons with Down syndrome, the Bertelson family and the Hageman family. At the end of the message, I'm going to share with you a poem that the Hageman family sent me about life with a son with Down syndrome. I wish you could have been here the last night of Amped Camp when they did tie-dye. 
Walton and Lyndon, uh, the Hageman sons, uh, they have this amazing bond. And they were tie-dyeing, and uh, Lyndon, the son with Down syndrome, he uh, had tie-dye all over him, so much so that I felt like I needed to apologize to Don D and Brad. I'm like, I promise it's going to come off. He's not going to be permanently dyed. But he was having the best time. And his brother was encouraging him, yet also keeping him within some boundaries because I think he would have tie-dyed everything that was around He was having the best time. And his love of life was and is absolutely contagious. It will be fun to watch him grow up and see how he lives into his potential. Society and culture would say that these gentlemen have limited potential. The Hagemans and the Bertelsons. And as people of faith, we can know that that story is very different. But I'm not just talking about people with disabilities. I'm talking to and with each of us. If you read in the book of Jeremiah where the prophet is talking to the people and and talking with God, the Jeremiah prophet hears, you know, um, you, I have known you since you were created in your mother's womb. And you are beautifully and wonderfully made. I have known you before. And then Jesus came along and tells us that God knows us now. And that who we are, our essence, our soul, it belongs to God. God is in us. And right now we're in very temporal bodies. But that soul is eternal. This morning, I invite us to look at a story from our Hebrew scriptures about a young man that ultimately uh, does not show great potential at the beginning, but he ends up making huge, huge differences in the world. He ends up saving his people, the Israelites, but he starts out a little bit like a punk. We don't normally talk about that when we talk about our forefathers of our faith, but it's true. Normally, I don't read a ton to you because, frankly, nobody really likes to be read to unless you're driving down the road and listening to, listening to Audible. So pretend that for just a minute. Pretend you're listening to Audible. Um, this story about Joseph, it's, it's just interesting So I invite you to just sit back and listen for just a few minutes about this story, about how the first part of it unfolds. And you see, this is important because so many times we give grandiose ideas to people that make huge differences, and and we only see the good. And we forget that every human being in this world struggles. Every human being has hurdles and difficulties and you know if you look on social media you're just not going to see that most likely we see all the good and we see all the filters but everybody's got stuff so I want you to hear the stuff from scripture in Genesis this morning the story of Joseph and his brother starts in chapter 37 Now, Joseph is the son of Jacob. This is the story of Jacob, and it continues with Joseph, who was 17 years old at the time. He's helping out his brothers and herding the flocks. And these are actually his half-brothers, the sons of his father's multiple wives, And Joseph brought his father bad reports on them. So that's like the first thing. He's a tattletale. 
Israel loved Joseph. Israel is the word that they use for Jacob. And, and I told you that this whole story goes along with polygamy and stuff. Like Jacob, who ultimately is the father of Joseph, he had some issues. Um, he is known as Israel in this passage, and which means wrestles with God. He had some jealousy issues with his brother. He tricks his father into giving him his brother's birthright. His bu- brother wants to kill him for a really, really long time and then they end up reconciling at the end so uh, there's all kinds of family drama here but Israel aka Jacob his dad he loved Joseph more than any of his other sons that's an issue because he was the child of his old age so throughout their lineage, like even with Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, these guys could not apparently father children with the women that they wanted to father children with. So then they would go get a new one. And the new wife would ultimately give birth to a son. And you know, back then the firstborn was supposed to have all these rights and stuff. And and so these wives that scripture tells us that were not their true loves would end up giving birth to their eldest son and then somehow miraculously they would end up having a baby with the life that wife that they really loved and so then they would show favoritism both this guy and his dad they would show favoritism to the son that was born from the wife that they loved this is why sister wives and there's no such thing as sister husbands but I'd like to know why not and you know why it's just just not a very good idea you know there's all this jealousy and hierarchy and, and stuff so it's a problem and it just I mean like if it's not ever a good idea either to have favorite children but much less write it in holy scripture which is why we should look at it all with a an appropriate lens Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was born when he was old. So he makes him an elaborately embroidered coat. Now, when the other brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. Newsflash, aha moment. They wouldn't even speak to him. Have any of y'all, do you remember your middle school days? Like when this little group would be together and this little group would be together and you'd want to be with that group, but you'd like try to go over and then they'd all turn their backs or it was very clear that you were not in that group. Like the fact that Joseph did not pick up on the fact that his other brothers, he was 17, his other brothers would not speak to him, that within itself is a small issue of self-awareness. They grew to hate him. And they wouldn't speak to him. So Joseph has a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said, listen to this dream that I had. We're all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat. And all of a sudden, my bundle stood straight up and all your bundles circled around it. And your bundles of wheat bowed down to mine. His brother said, so you're going to rule us? You're going to boss us around? And then they hated him even more than ever because of his dreams and the way he talked. He had another dream, and he told this one also to his brothers. I dreamed another dream. This one's even bigger. The sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. When he told this dream to his father and his brothers, his father reprimanded him. What's with all this dreaming? Am I and your mother and your brothers all supposed to bow down to you? Now his brothers were really jealous, but his father brooded over the whole business. His brothers had gone off where they were pasturing their father's flocks, and Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are with the flocks. Come, I want to send you to them. And Joseph said, I'm ready. He said, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing and bring me back a report. And so he sent him on his way. 
a man met him as he was wandering through the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? And he says, I'm trying to find my brothers. Do you have any idea where they are grazing their flocks? The man said, they've left here, but I overheard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph took off tracked his brothers down, and found them in Dothan. They spotted him off in the distance. By the time he got to them, they had cooked up a plot to kill him. The brothers were saying, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these old cisterns, a well. We can say that a vicious animal ate him up. Then we'll see what his dreams amount to. Reuben, who is one of the brothers, heard the brothers talking and intervened to save him. We're not going to kill him. Let's not have any murder. Let's just go ahead and throw him in the cistern out here in the wild. But let's not hurt him. I guess hurting back then was relative. Reuben planned to go back later and get him out and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off the fancy coat he was wearing, grabbed him, threw him in the cistern. It was dry. There wasn't any water. Then they sat down to eat their supper. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites, who Ishmael was one of the sons of Abraham, and that is, frankly, where the religion of Islam is traced back to. They saw people from the tribe of Ishmael, and their camels were loaded with spices and ointments and perfumes to sell in Egypt, so clearly they were people of wealth. Judah, one of the brothers, said, Hey, What are we going to get out of killing our brother and concealing the evidence? Let's sell him instead. He is, after all, our brother, our own flesh and blood. So his brothers agreed. By that time, the traders were passing by. His brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took Joseph with them down to Egypt. Later, Reuben, who I guess was not a part of all this, came back and went to the cistern and was in despair. He ripped his clothes, and beside himself, he went to his brothers. The boy is gone. What am I going to do? They took his coat, butchered a goat, and dipped the coat in blood. They took the fancy coat back to their father and said, We found this. Look at this. And his father, their father, was distraught. The story goes on for several chapters in Genesis, and I invite you to take some time and and look at it and read it in detail, or frankly, in today's world, you can watch it on YouTube. But it's this amazing story of a young man who lacks some self-awareness. I mean, he was excited. He just had this really, really cool dream, and all the Wheat bundles were bowing down to him, so clearly he's got some great potential. And then he has another dream, and and remember back then they did everything around the sun and the moon and the stars. They held so much importance to them in their day-to-day life. It was their geography. It, It was everything. And so in his second dream, that is having such an impact. And then he ends up being put in a place where he's left for dead. That had to jerk some of that self-awareness into him in an unfortunate way. And then they sell him. Can you imagine what he felt then? But he doesn't give up. He goes on, he is a slave in Egypt, and he keeps having dreams, and he tells people the dreams, and then they get to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh calls him in, and he ultimately ends up saving his family later on because there's a huge famine, and they come to Egypt, and he saves the day. So see, even our ancient Hebrew scriptures give us pictures of potential, missed potential, and then trouble, and hurdles, and then success. Where are you in your journey? 
Do you see your potential? There are so many quotes about realized potential and those kinds of things, but one said that, and I didn't recognize the author's name or it was just a, a random quote, but it said, you know, potential, living into your potential is when you wake up every day and you try to be a better person and your best self just a little more than yesterday. So many times we set these huge, huge goals for ourselves, and then when we don't reach them, we feel like failures. What if we come to an awareness of our potential in the here and now and think about that potential and then try to live into it incrementally? See what a difference that could make. Odds are you've heard of Michelangelo. Here's a picture of Michelangelo, or a painting of him. And here is an image of one of his famous works. And now I want you to hear this quote from Michelangelo. The greater danger for most of us lies, not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. So we need to find a balance. Not be so grandiose that it's unattainable and we beat ourselves up, but also not setting our aim and our bar so low that we never live in to who we are created to be. It's one of the powerful points about this movie is that Zach does not let his disability define him. I want you to take a look at this first clip. So because someone told him that there were limits in his life, he thinks he can't achieve his dream, even though he really wants to achieve his dream and he wants to be like this wrestler that he's followed. People told him that he wasn't enough. So maybe you haven't had someone be that bold to speak those words to you that you're crappy and, and not enough. But we unfortunately live in a time and a space when lots of other things tell us subliminally and subconsciously that we're not enough. I was on a Zoom call of, a few months ago with some folks from that study that I was in with uh, Johns Hopkins, and, and we were talking about the, the, the FDA's approval of psilocybin in therapeutic settings and all this kind of stuff, and, and the, the studies coming out in September, and, and we were talking about that. There's a, a Parliament of World Religions that starts next Sunday in Chicago. And so they're going to have a listening session uh, with Richard Rohr, who is one of my theological heroes and, and hopefully one of yours as well. And the folks from Johns Hopkins and NYU and Berkeley and some doctors and scientists. And uh, it's going to be a fascinating week in this realm of study. And I, I keep my toes in that water just enough. I don't have the bandwidth with being a, a, a full-time pastor to have my whole self immersed in that culture. But I try to keep just enough in there. And, and so I was in this Zoom call, and they were talking about all this stuff and talking about what are the repercussions. And will there be any when the study is released, especially for those who are quoted publicly and their names are used? Because, you know, um, there are are negative connotations associated with this stuff as well. And so I said, well, I'm pretty sure in the Book of Discipline it says, and that's like the Methodist guidebook, and I said, but our, our assistant to the bishop and our bishop knows that I was a part of this study, so I don't think it'll be a big deal because they were concerned that I was going to be quoted and all this kind of stuff. And um, they said, well, it's not the Book of Discipline. I'm like, what? And this guy, I don't know who he was or anything, but he's like, it's not the book of discipline. I'm like, he's, it's the book of resolutions. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I don't even own a book of discipline. Like, everything I need to know is online, and it's written every four years, so I don't want to spend $30 every four years, and um, I just don't need one. And I really don't have a book of resolutions, okay? So I'm like, 
okay, sorry. I said, I thought it was the book of discipline. And so then, like, at the end of the Zoom call, when it's like this spiritual moment, and, you know, we're getting ready to close in prayer and stuff, the guy unmutes his little thing, and he's like, it's actually on page 311, blah, 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 blah. Like, breaks the whole train of thought to come back and point out how right he is and how wrong that I am about the book of discipline and the book of resolutions, when at the end of the day, it really does not matter. And honestly, haven't been to a Zoom meeting since. I would like to say that it's because I'm busy, and I have been really busy, busier than normal, but um, it's also because of my ego and my little wounded pride. Where do we let Things that are said, things that are unsaid, things we read on social media, things we see in the marketing media. Where do we let other things in our world and in our culture eat away at our self-esteem so that we end up missing our potential? If we're honest, there are things, whether it's lack of praise or or, you know, passive-aggressive criticism, or just our own failures. Look, it's okay to fail. We're all going to fail. We're all going to mess up. The whole point of failure is to learn from it and do just a little more. And the really cool thing about this story in Peanut Butter Falcon is that the lead character, like, he, Zach asks him, he's like, are you a good guy or a bad guy? And he won't answer the question because he knows that these people are coming to hunt him, trying to, trying to kill him because he owes them $12,000 and he doesn't have it. And I don't want to spoil all the movie, but he has some other stuff in his past, some mistakes that he made that were costly. Back to the scripture story, Joseph, I mean, he was a boastful 17-year-old guy, excited about his dreams, so excited that his stepbrothers didn't like him, hated him. And tried to get rid of him. But it didn't stop him from living into his full potential. What do you need to do? What do we need to do in our own lives? Whether it's work or family or friends or just personal. That's going to enable us to live into our full potential. And remember, you don't have to get from A to Z tomorrow. It's incrementally, step by step. Let every day have a higher mark so that we live into that. I want you to take a look at this last clip from the movie. So the guy that you saw on the screen with the blue shirt and the cowboy hat, that was the famous wrestler that Zach had followed all those years. And, and they actually took him to his home so that he could meet him. And, and the wrestler shares with them, like, you know, my camp, my wrestling camp and school has been closed for 10 years. And, and then Zach even asked about that famous move that you see him do, like lift him up over his shoulders and, and throw people out of the ring. And the wrestler says, look, that was fake, like, we just made it look like that on TV. The angles would be different. And so that was a false, a false reality. It didn't even happen. But because Zach had people that poured into him and loved him and trained him and helped him, like it became his reality. At the beginning of the movie, you see him learning to shoot a gun, and the kickback of the shot is so powerful it knocks him down. But he keeps working at being stronger, and ultimately, he ends up being so strong that he wins the wrestling match. That's how it is with our lives, if we keep working, and if we don't give up. What's your grit factor? 
Is it 100? Is it 110? You're willing to see the hurdles in front of you and, and just persevere and push through them so that you can be your potential? Or are you living in the below 50%? And are you not living into who God has created and called you to be? The Hagemans, I shared with you, shared a poem with me that someone shared with them upon learning about their son's disability. I want to share that poem with you now. It's called Welcome to Holland by Emily Kingsley. When you're going to have a baby, it's like you're planning a vacation to Italy. You're all excited, you get a whole bunch of guidebooks, and you learn a few phrases so you can get around, and then it comes time to pack your bags and head for the airport. Only when you land, the stewardess says, welcome to Holland. You look at one another in disbelief and shock, saying, Holland? What are you talking about? I signed up for Italy. But they explained that there's been a change of plan, that you've landed in Holland and there you must stay. But I don't know anything about Holland you say, I don't want to stay. But stay, you do. You go out, you buy some new guidebooks, and you learn some new phrases, and you meet people you never knew existed. The important thing is you're not in a bad place filled with despair. You're simply in a different place than you had planned. It's slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy, but after you've been there a little while and you've had a chance to catch your breath, you begin to discover that Holland has windmills and tulips and Rembrandts. Everyone else you know is busy coming and going from Italy. They're all bragging about what a great time they had there, and most likely, this, these are my words, putting it on social media. And for the rest of your life, you'll say, yeah, that's what I had planned. The pain of that plan will never go away. You have to accept that pain because the loss of that dream, the loss of that plan, is a very, very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you will never be free to enjoy ah the very special and very lovely things about Holland. I hope you get a chance to meet Lyndon and Walton or Justin Bertelson or Adam Lumley's grandson or any other individuals that live with disabilities. It's a disability, but it doesn't define them or cause them to be lesser than as people. We all have potential, and we are created in the beautiful and powerful and perfect image of God. Let's live in to our potential. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you have created us, and we are beautifully and wonderfully made, and we have amazing people in this world that teach us and show us what it means to live fully, like the Hagemans and the Bertelsons and other folks in our midst. God, thank you for loving us and giving us the oomph and the grit to be who we're created and called to be. God, make our pathways plain before us so we will see and know where it is we are to go. And then give us all that we need to get there. We offer ourselves in Christ's name. Amen. So I want you to check out this quote from Wayne Gretzky. Do you know who that is? He is a hockey player. You miss 100% of the shot. Is he a hockey player? That's right. Okay. I, I thought it looked like a hockey outfit on him or uniform or whatever it is. You miss and listen. I did so good with all the wrestling things and now it's all going to pot. Anyway, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. What shots do you need to take this week? 
There are a couple of pastoral care things that I want to uh, share with you this morning. We don't normally do that verbally, but these are just um, imminent things. And, and when it's the West staff, I do share pastoral care concerns because they don't really have small groups. They have all of you. Uh, first of all, this one, uh, Brandy Spangler was just in, she's a part of West, a freak accident on Monday. They were getting ready to come help unload the bash truck. A guy was working in their attic, a workman, and he fell through their attic attic floor on top of her. She was standing right underneath him. Then they both slid down a huge stairwell. It knocked her unconscious. They didn't know if, if she was okay for quite some time. She is, and all the medical personnel told her she was lucky to be alive, and the gentleman is as well. But um, please keep Brandy in your prayers. She has a long, long recovery ahead of her. Uh, secondly, Bob Pettit, Josh Pettit, one of our staff people. Uh, you know, we've shared with you before that Josh's mom, Betty, Bob's wife, has uh, late stages of Alzheimer's. Well, Bob suffered from a stroke yesterday and is in the hospital. And Josh was at one of his uh, jobs out west, flew back this morning. And so uh, Bob's in the hospital, please. He's conscious and everything, a loss of some vision. So that's going to make it even more challenging for them to care for Betty. So please keep Josh and Bob in your prayers. And finally, I want you to keep uh, the Gatlin family in our in your prayers, our prayers. Luann is up here to my left and Michael is to my right. Luann's husband, John, his brother was killed uh, tragically last weekend or, or well, he died ultimately this week. He was riding his bicycle uh, or cycling and a car hit him. And so uh, they are celebrating his life today. Luann leads our worship team and plans the music with Gary and, and is getting ready in her retirement to step into helping us with pastoral care. So we are excited about that. But um, an unpaid staff. But anyway, please keep the Gatlin family in your prayers today and, and each other. It's important to be a part of a community. And now let's go make all the shots that we take and, and the ones that we don't make be like, okay, I'll try again tomorrow. Go in peace. Amen.